Well, thank you so much. And it's uh, an absolute privilege and uh, a delight to be here this morning. And can I thank the organisers of the conference for the kind invitation to be here. Uh, and I acknowledge um, all of the people in the room and the wise wisdom and counsel that you bring with you from the range of locations across the globe that you come. So this morning I'm very proud to be representing the vibrant Australian education sector, which has a very strong commitment to equipping students with both the fundamental skills of literacy and numeracy and creative and critical thinking skills. We used to think of creativity as the realm of musicians, dancers, actors, artists, writers, inventors, and in more recent days, innovators. And most of these pursuits presume that something is made, a painting, a character, an app. Yet the original meaning of the Latin root word for creativity was to make something grow. And making something and someone grow is what all educators aim to do, recognising that to successfully live and work in today's world and tomorrow requires creativity. It requires critical thinking to ensure we make informed judgments and it requires a great solid understanding of how literacy and numeracy is a means to unlock deeper subject knowledge. And both of these are required. They're required because they're, we're required to find solutions to balancing the competing um, demands of uh, a modern life transformed by technology and globalisation. While there is little disruption or little dispute could I say, over the importance and the need for creative and critical thinking skills, there is much more required to create and, and to sustain an authorising environment and conditions in order for these vital skills to flourish. There is no doubt that we have a social and an economic imperative, not to mention the moral imperative, to ensure that we prepare our young people for the world in which they live, so that they have the skills for life and work. We're almost two decades now into the 21st century, and it's self-evident that education systems all over the world are changing and need to. Ensuring that the education field is well positioned to support both individual and national endeavours requires us to cre create and sustain an authorising environment for our endeavours. An authorising environment requires more than political will and sector support. We will need to reflect on how we think, how we as educators craft our responses to emerging issues and challenges and on the importance we place on the nature and the type of learning we do as individuals and as an education community of practice. Just want to refer to this quote by uh, Peter Ellerton. Thinking well is also about learning how to think with others to in effect become part of a broader social cognition that can achieve more collectively than is possibly individually. And I believe that there are a number of key elements to building this authorising environment that we talk about, one that supports change, allows us to be creative, to do things differently and to embrace disruption. We must work from the basis of knowing what matters, knowing why it matters and knowing why it matters now. We must make sure that the fundamentals of teaching and learning and measurement are never lost. And we must invest in education leadership and teacher support in development. Let's always remember that our teachers are at the forefront of change, implementing new policies, procedures and approaches and navigating that ever-changing curriculum requirements. We should also remember that the recognition of public value of education underpins our authorising environment. Today, our alliances extend beyond the educational sphere and are recognised for the influence they bear on issues relating to broader society, 
including business and industry, workforce needs and active citizenship. And it is these groups and sectors that should be among our endorsers. We must look outside our sector to forge these alliances and garner their voices, their influence to support our authorising environment. Recognition by the public of the value of critical and creative thinking skills alongside literacy and numeracy is very important. It is important because these aspects hold their rightful place in an education landscape where it's essential to have both to enable students to fulfil their potential. We do need more conversations, discussion and debate centred on the importance of relevance and the intrinsic value add that these capabilities bring in domain specific areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Australian context and, and uh, in our country, an initial uh, commitment to an Australian curriculum by all nine education ministers, national, state and territory, was reflected in 2008 by the Melbourne Declaration and Education Goals for Young Australians. And we've been working with a ministerial endorsed national curriculum foundation to year 10 since 2015. The principles or the core, some of the um, core organising principles that centre upon critical and creative thinking that you find within our national curriculum, it recognises that the primary purpose of education is the development of thinking skills. It acknowledges that critical and creative thinking are essential capabilities for students in today's world, and while not interchangeable, they are strongly linked bringing complementary, complementary dimensions to thinking and learning. The Australian curriculum and our national curriculum is one element of our strong education architecture in the country, which includes national education goals, consistent school leadership, quality accredited teacher training and professional standards for both teachers and principals. Our Australian curriculum provides stability and flexibility, an environment for innovative jurisdictional approaches to flourish, and indeed they have in, de in the domains of critical and creative thinking. There's the Victorian critical and creative thinking curriculum, the CCT curriculum approach, with its content descriptions and achievement standards to support teachers plan, teach and track student learning in critical and creative thinking. They also have psychometric validated assessment tasks mapped to the existing scope and structure of the curriculum. And this approach is based on the belief that critical and creative thinking support access to every learning area and need to be explicitly introduced, taught, practiced, demonstrated and assessed, stating that if you can't explicitly teach these skills of critical and creative thinking, then you can explicit, then you can in, uh, explicitly assess them. And I know Sharon Foster, who's over here on my left, is here from Victoria, uh, and Sharon is having a session later today on the innovation assessment for a broader set of skills, our session later today. In another jurisdiction in the state of New South Wales, the Education for a Changing World project um, is examining the strategic implications that advance artificial intelligence AI and other emerging technologies will have for education. It's deliberately designed to change how curriculum and curriculum policies are developed in a state and what is measured and assessed. Critical and creative thinking is a focus area with the project exploring why thinking skills are considered important for success in an AI influenced world and what thinking skills young people need to develop their sense of agency and become proactive and ethical members of society. In parallel to the changing uh, Education for a Changing World project, New South Wales has been reviewing its curriculum, including an expected look at the balance between the 21st century skills and key content. And that review report's about to release shortly. Critically, um, the, the, and currently, critical and creative thinking is embedded across the curriculum in the New South Wales syllabuses. It's delivered in specific contents through a range of approaches, 
including engagement in philosophy and project inquiry-based learning in schools and assessed with content. The Education for a Changing World project began in 2017 and has stimulated and informed discussions about education policies and reforms needed to prepare young people for their future. In its focus on critical and creative thinking, the project has curated subject matter expertise from academic um, institutions, from industry, from educationalists, into a great online resource of occasional papers, targeted panel and conference events, mini podcasts called Ed Expressos, book anthologies and social media. Suggest so you have a look at the website. There's a whole lot of material on that New South Wales uh, website that goes to copies of that material and the work that they're undertaking in their journey to ensure that they prepare young people around the project. Um, in one of the occasional papers that has been produced, How to Teach Critical Thinking, author Daniel T. Willingham concludes that scientists are united in their belief that content knowledge is crucial to effective thinking. Further, he says it's not useful to think of critical thinking skills once acquired as broadly applicable. And his argument is that the analysis, synthesis and evaluation mean very different things in different disciplines. And so goals for student critical thinking must be domain specific. In addition to this work, New South Wales is also a dedicated centre applying innovation techniques uh, to education. The Catalyst Lab Innovation Program is developing a skills-based framework and a digital tool to teach students future skills. Both that framework and tool highlight the whole student approach, including thinking skills, creative and critical. The thinking skills are mapped to the domains, to syllabus-based content, as well as to our Australian curriculum, the general capabilities, including critical and creative thinking. I'm looking forward to hearing the results of the current testing and validation of that framework as they take the next step forward. So you can see that Australia, within our context of Australia, there are a number of different approaches. New South Wales and Victoria have taken very different approaches a demonstration of the debate about whether critical and creative uh, thinking are general or transferable or content and discipline specific. There's certainly agreement though that these skills can be developed and done so in a considered and integrated way. In our digitally connected world, it would be counterintuitive to develop these skills in isolation of one another and of subject matter. And there's general recognition that it's time we move from fragmented curriculum and add-ons to systemic approaches. So back to Dr. Willingham, who says, planning how to teach students to think critically should perhaps be our second task. Our first should be reassuring ourselves that such instruction is needed and can succeed. Now, in finishing all over the world, education, we know as educators, is a very powerful tool at individual, family, community and national levels. It benefit, its benefits are economic, social and cultural. We cannot underestimate the significant role that we play and the responsibility that we have for crafting and preparing students for what might come next. Right now, there are fragments of innovation rather than a coherent approach to moving the agenda forward. We have to, we have to think about what that means for us on creativity and critical thinking skills in our schools. With all of that, I strong believe that there is a single place to start, and that is the belief that it is possible. We would be educationally negligent not to capitalise on the latent potential held by both creativity and critical thinking to prepare students for contemporary life. They add to the central tenements and determinants for the generation of new knowledge and new solutions to emerging social, environmental and economic challenges. We must invest in our teachers their support is essential 
for sustaining the authorising environment in which creative and critical thinking skills can flourish. And this means consistent teacher support through career cycles, the pre-service, the during the service, people who are returning to the teaching service. In other words, making sure we have a continuum of professional learning and support. And most importantly of all, the humanity of education must be a non-negotiable principle as we move the agenda forward. It is a collective challenge for us to identify the defining qualities, attributes and capabilities of being human and humane in today's world. This will enable our teachers to equip students with the skills to live, work and achieve in a world of social, cultural, environmental, digital and technological complexity. A world where our young people have the interpersonal skills and the judgments to make ethical decisions in an increasing virtual and AI influenced world. If we lose our focus on the humanity of education, we do a disservice to those we educate and to our individual and collective futures. Thank you. But I'd like to open the floor for a few questions. I know that it is not a shy audience, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Matt. Good morning. Wonderful speech. Um, so I'm from the United States, Matt Doyle in California. And I, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on coherence, because we too struggle with um, the disparate parts of our organization trying to transform. But it's the coherence that seems to be the, the difficult aspect of that. It is. I think we, um, we can sometimes tend, you know, tend to focus on all things curriculum, and then we turn our attention to all things teacher professional learning, and then we think about you know, all the industrial relations type thing, and then we turn to learning environments. And how we actually bring that together is always a challenge. I don't think there's any one you know, easy answer to it. But I think we have to be increasingly aware of the interconnectedness of all of those things to achieve better outcomes for students. And, and maybe one place to start, we all know that our quality teaching is a significant um, impact on student learning outcomes. And so if we take a life cycle approach to who's teaching our teachers, you know, what are we doing to support the existing workforce? And what are we doing in our case, we have a slight returning workforce, those that are coming back for two or three days a week, not doing five anymore, but two and three days a week. So I think that coherence in terms of policy requires I think a meta-architecture look at that and a sensible approach. Most things that have stickiness in education are deliberate by design. They don't just happen. And so it requires policy makers to think through those issues and to think about what that means. In our context, in the Australian context, we have a number of building blocks. We've gone for teacher professional standards. We've gone for school leadership standards. We've gone for curriculum standards. Uh, in a way that are the building blocks. And then each of the jurisdictions, in our case, the New South Wales, Victoria, the South Australia and so forth, the, seven, the states and territories, uh, operationalise those so that we also get the benefit of localisation. And that's critically important. We, we haven't gone national curriculum all, but there, because of the federation in Australia, it comes down to each state and territory taking those building blocks thinking about what the local needs of their students and schools are and then translating that into a program of work and practice. And I'm sure Sharon can share some of those in her session this afternoon around Victoria. And my colleague uh, Rick Purse from South Australia, who looks after the South Australian school system, is also here and I'm sure South Australia does the same things, takes those building blocks, operationalises it in a way that makes sense for, for local. But not an easy cast. More questions? Again, thank you very much for a really wonderful speech. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, to elaborate on the uh, professional skill of the teacher. We all know that the teacher that we have this day are recruited based on their qualification on old style teaching. But now for, for them to be qualified for uh, 
putting in the critical thinking skill or uh, especially the innovation skill is really difficult to decide what kind of teacher qualify for that and how to train them? It's a very good question. You know, I think in decades gone past, it was set and forget. You know, when I, I began my um, career as a teacher um, and a primary and then went on to secondary maths teaching, and uh, once I had my qualification, away I went. But like all professions, the constant upgrading of skills um, is needed. So professional practice of teachers, whether it's in communities of practice, whether it's accessing uh, professional learning, I think is, is incredibly important. Uh, the world is changing so quickly that uh, in order to teach and do the very best for the students we take responsibilities for, uh, it's, it's incumbent on the profession uh, to make sure that we always keep speed and therefore a lot of systems I know around the world have a whole range of supporting teacher professional practice. Um, is it ever enough? You know, there's the returning teacher that might be up to date. There is the existing workforce and in our system, I can talk to the Australian education system, we've got about an 80% uh, an existing workforce. So your existing workforce in my context is very important that we support um, and enhance their professional learning. We have a minimum number of hours required for teacher professional learning. Um, in some, is it enough? Probably not. It's it's you know very very small at the moment. We started at 20 hours a year um, of additional professional learning, um, and uh, that's 100 hours over five years. Um, is that sufficient? Probably our teaching workforce would tell us no, it's not compared with the changes that are coming down in curriculum and the landscape that's changing and, and the compounding issues that they're dealing with. But I think that's a start. And I think a reflection on what teacher professional learning policy is and how best support um, teachers. And that means administrators and educators have to all think about what they do to support. You know, our thinking will be challenged as administrators as well. You know, and there's no doubt about that. And my point... Um, in the presentation about thinking about each one of us as individuals and a collective group of um, education practitioners, how we learn from one another, how we stimulate thinking, um, how we create a, an environment where best practice is shared. And also we share the things that haven't worked, importantly. There are many things in systems that don't work and I'm not sure that our public discourse or our debate and conversation actually puts hand on heart and says these things just didn't work. But what have we learnt from the things that haven't worked and move forward from there? A big question. I think everyone has to reflect on current workforce, the new workforce coming in, who's teaching that new workforce in the universities and tertiary education, returning workforce, and indeed uh, how, you know, the impact of AI and, and computer. Yeah. I could talk about my three grandchildren. Would that help? And they are <laughs> <laughs> through, through their lens. <laughs> Perhaps one follow-up question on what you just said. Um, you know, you've changed the curriculum. You've tried to actually shape communities of practice among teachers. And can you tell us to what extent it worked? So what have you done in terms of, you know, the platform that you've put in place? Has it changed something or, you know... Um, I, th I think we have seen change, but I think my point about fragmented innovation, you know, the challenge is how do you scale it? How do you scale it? You're always going to have pockets of innovation and really fantastic things going. How do you grow that to a system level and what are the, the levers you can pull to get that scaled, you know, in a way? So each, each one of our systems, each one of our countries could highlight a particular case study that's working very well. Um, the challenge for us is to scale it. And I think in the Australian context, we're seeing innovation happen in each of our jurisdictions. Um, are we there yet? As we'd say, no, we're not. You know, we have a journey to go, to be, to be honest. And, uh, but, but taking an approach where we try things, understand what, wor what works and what hasn't, and giving that authorising environment so that we can trial those things uh, and work in a, in a risk uh, approach is very important, I think, for our, our our profession. You know, I think our teachers, when you look at any system, you know, our teachers, you know, they are the huge component 
That's the intellectual capacity that resides within our education system. You know, and unless we think about them being an absolute resource and the intellectual capacity of education, I think we will lose a great deal. Sorry. Thank you again. <laughs> I would like to ask you on the macro level, how would you go to assess what you achieve or not achieved and so on? Because it's, it makes a big difference if it's on the micro level or on the macro level in terms of the whole country and so on. Yeah. I actually think uh, we, we need the best. I, I made the point about we should never forget that measurement matters and we shouldn't get into a dichotomous debate that all things that are measured are bad and all things that aren't are good. And the world can go that way sometimes in discussion and debate. I actually think teacher observation is an untapped resource. But what we need to do to support teacher observation skills is to underpin that with what growth and good practice looks like in some of these dimensions that are really hard um, at the moment. We're pushing at the forefront. So we need to be able to quantify or describe the characteristics of growth and then ask teachers to make judgments about where students are on that continuum. It can be under, underpinned by an interval scale. If you take the measurement perspective, it can be underpinned by a description of what what um, a growing order of sophistication, such as learning progressions, will, will indicate. And that provides a roadmap in order for teachers to do that. And I think at the micro level that matters. So that you create in your mind for a teacher a valid and reliable means of comparison. Because sometimes our teachers may only know their means of comparison might be who they've taught. And they need to take a bigger view than the classroom they're in and so having clearly articulated and descriptive um, standard scales often provide a broader means of comparisons for teachers to know what they're looking for and how well students are achieving. There is always strength in diversity. <laughs> I think, I think uh, um, you know, at times when, when we do Commonwealth state relationship, I'm not saying they're always easy, there is always discussion and debate about... Uh, state Commonwealth relations in our country and that plays out in different way on different. But in the main, I think uh, in, in terms of teaching and learning, the intent is the same. The philosophy about what we can do to better support student learning is central and putting student voice and advocacy at the centre of what we do is pretty common across all jurisdictions. Uh, the politics will change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as it will federally. And I think underneath that is a wonderful set of educators um, who are working very hard in a very collaborative way uh, to both share what's happening in different jurisdictions. And yes, of course, we could always do more of that. And I think that becomes the network and the knitting underneath uh, the federation um, that is strong. It doesn't mean to say at times politics doesn't, you know, you flare, you'll see it in the media in any jurisdiction. But I think the good willingness and the way in which the collaboration works across the states uh, and territories on some really difficult issues, whether it be funding, whether it be, you know, assessment, whether it be workforce, national workforce, whether at the moment we're talking about a national evidence institute and what that means and how it will be governed, uh, is pretty, pretty strong, I think, in our Australian context. I think, uh, you know, we learn from that, we learn from one another, and in, in the main, I think we've got a very good collaborative and collegial working environment while being geographically isolated. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. My pleasure. My pleasure.